Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki Chapter 6 You cannot see money with your eyes. Money is an idea that is more clearly seen with your mind. In late 1974 I purchased a small condominium on the fringes of Waikiki as one of my first investment properties. The price was $56,000 for a cute two-bedroom, one-bath unit in an average building. It was a perfect rental unit and I knew it would rent quickly. I drove to my rich dad's office, all excited about showing him the deal. He glanced at the documents and, in less than a minute, he looked up and asked, how much money are you losing a month? About $100 a month, I said. Don't be foolish, rich dad said. I haven't gone over the numbers, but I can already tell from the written documents that you're losing much more than that. And besides, why in the world would you knowingly invest in something that loses money? Well, the unit looked nice, and I thought it was a good deal. A little paint and the place would be as good as new, I said. That doesn't justify knowingly losing money, smirked Rich Dad. Well, my real estate agent said not to worry about losing money every month. He said that, in a few years, the price of this unit will double. In addition, the government gives me a tax break on the money I lose. Besides, it was such a good deal that I was afraid someone else would buy it if I didn't. Rich Dad stood and closed his office door. When he did that, I knew I was about to be chewed out as well as be taught an important lesson. I'd been through these types of educational sessions before. So how much money are you losing a month? Rich Dad asked again. About $100, I repeated nervously. Rich Dad shook his head as he scanned the documents. The lesson was about to begin. On that day, I learned more about money and investing than I had in all my previous 27 years of life. Rich Dad was happy that I took the initiative and invested in a property, but I'd made some grave mistakes that could have been a financial disaster. However, the lessons I learned from that one investment have made me millions over the years. Money is seen with your mind. It's not what your eyes see, said Rich Dad. A piece of real estate is a piece of real estate. A company stock certificate is a company stock certificate. You can see those things. But it's what you can't see that's important. It's the deal, the financial agreement, the market, the management, the risk factors, the cash flow, the corporate structuring, the tax laws, and a thousand other things that make something a good investment or not. He then proceeded to tear the deal apart with questions. Why would you pay such a high interest rate? What do you figure your return on investment to be? How does this investment fit into your long-term financial strategy? What vacancy factor are you using? What is your cap rate? Have you checked the association's history of assessments? Have you figured in management costs? What percentage rate did you use to compute repairs? Did you know that the city has just announced it will be tearing up the roads in that area and changing the traffic pattern? A major thoroughfare will run right in front of your building. Residents are moving to avoid the year-long project. Did you know that? I know the market trend is up today, but do you know what is driving that trend, business economics or greed? How long do you think the trend will continue up? What happens if this place doesn't rent? And if it doesn't, how long can you keep this place and yourself afloat? And again, what goes on in your head to make you think that losing money is a good deal? This really has me worried. It looked like a good deal, I said, deflated. Rich Dad smiled, stood up, and shook my hand. I'm glad you took action, he said. Most people think, but never do. If you do something, you make mistakes, and it's from our mistakes that we learn the most. Remember that anything important, important can't really be learned in the classroom. It must be learned by taking action, making mistakes, and then correcting them. That's when wisdom sets in. I felt a little better and was ready to learn. Rich Dad went on to explain that people look at a piece of real estate or the name of a stock and often make their decision based on what their eyes see, what a broker tells them or on a hot tip from a fellow worker. They often buy emotionally instead of rationally. That's why 9 out of 10 investors don't make money, said Rich Dad. While they might not lose money, they don't make any either. 
they just sort of break even, making some and losing some. That's because they invest with their eyes and emotions rather than with their minds. Many people invest because they want to get rich quickly. So instead of becoming investors, they wind up being dreamers, hustlers, gamblers, and crooks. The world is filled with them. So let's sit down, go back over this losing deal you just bought, and I'll teach you how to turn it into a winning deal. I'll begin to teach your mind to see what your eyes can't. From bad to good. The next morning I went back to the real estate agent, rejected the deal as it stood, and reopened negotiation. It wasn't a pleasant process, but I learned a lot. Three days later, I returned to see Rich Dad. The price of the condo stayed the same, and the agent got his full commission because he deserved it. But while the price remained the same, the terms of the investment were vastly different. By renegotiating the interest rate, payment terms, and the amortization period, instead of losing money, I was now certain of making a net profit of $80 per month, even after the management fee and an allowance for vacancy was factored in. I could even lower my rent and still make money if the market went bad. I could definitely raise the rent if the market got better. I estimated that you were going to lose at least $150 per month, said Rich Dad. Probably more. If you had continued to lose $150 per month based on your salary and expenses, how many of these deals could you afford? Barely one, I replied. Most months, I don't have an extra $150. If I had done the original deal, I would have struggled financially every month, even after the tax breaks. I might even have had to take an extra job to pay for this investment. And now, how many of these deals at $80 positive cash flow can you afford? Asked Rich Dad. I smiled and said, as many as I can get my hands on. Rich Dad nodded in approval. Now go out there and get your hands on more of them. A few years later, the real estate prices in Hawaii did skyrocket. But instead of having only one property go up in value, I had seven double in value. That is the power of a little financial intelligence. You can't do that. When I took my new offer back to the real estate agent, all he said to me was, you can't do that. What took the longest time was convincing the agent to start thinking about how we could do what I wanted done. In any event, there were many lessons I learned from this one investment, investment, and one of those lessons was to realize that, when someone says to you, you can't do that, they may have one finger pointing forward at you, but three fingers are pointing backward at them. Rich Dad taught me that you can't do that doesn't necessarily mean you can't. It more often means they can't. A classic example took place many years ago when people told the Wright brothers, you can't do that. Thank goodness, the Wright brothers didn't listen. $1.4 trillion looking for a home. Every day trillions of dollars are moved around the planet electronically. There is more money being created and available today than ever before. The problem is that money is invisible. Today, the bulk of it is electronic. So when people look for money with their eyes, they fail to see anything. Most people struggle to live paycheck to paycheck, and yet $1.4 trillion flies around the world every day looking for someone who wants it. It's looking for someone who knows how to take care of it, nurture it, and grow it. If you know how to take care of money, mo money will flock to you and be thrown at you. People will beg you to take it. But if you don't know how to care for money, money will stay away from you. Remember Rich Dad's definition of financial intelligence, it's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep, how hard it works for you, and how many generations you keep it for. The blind leading the blind. The average person is 95% eyes and only 5% mind when they invest, said Rich Dad. If you want to become a professional in the BNI quadrants, you need to train your eyes to be only 5% and train your mind to see the other 95%. Rich Dad went on to explain that people who train their minds to see money have tremendous power over people who don't. He was adamant about whom I took financial advice from. The reason most people struggle financially is because they take advice from people who are also mentally blind to money. It's the classic tale of the blind leading the blind. If you want money to come to you, you must know how to take care of it. If money isn't first in your head, it won't stick to your hands. 
If it doesn't stick to your hands, then money, and people with money, will stay away from you. Train your brain to see money. So what is the first step in training your brain to see money? The answer is easy. It's financial literacy. It begins with the ability to understand the words and the number systems of capitalism. If you don't understand the words or the numbers, you might as well be speaking a foreign language. And, in many cases, each quadrant represents a foreign language. If you look at the cash flow quadrant, each quadrant is like a different country. They don't all use the same words, and if you don't understand the words, you won't understand the numbers. For example, if a medical doctor says, your systolic is 120 and your diastolic is 80, is that good or bad? Is that all you need to know for your, your health? The answer is obviously no, but it's a start. It's like asking, my stock's PE is 12 and my apartment's cap rate is 12. Is this all I need to know for my wealth? Again, the answer is no, but it's a start. At least we're beginning to speak the same words and use the same numbers. And that is the beginning of financial literacy, which is the basis of financial intelligence. It starts with knowing the words and numbers. The doctor is speaking from the S quadrant, and the investor is speaking with the words and numbers of the I quadrant. They might as well be speaking different languages. I disagree when someone says to me, it takes money to make money. In my opinion, the ability to make money with money begins with understanding the words and the numbers. As my rich dad always said, if money is not first in your head, it won't stick to your hands. Know what real risk is. The second step in training your brain to see money is to learn to recognize what real risk is. When people say to me that investing is risky, I simply say, say investing is not risky. Being uneducated is risky. Investing is much like flying. If you've been to flight school and spent a number of years gaining experience, then flying is fun and exciting. But if you've never been to flight school, I'd leave the flying to someone else. Bad advice is risky. Rich Dad firmly believed that any financial advice was better than no financial advice. He was a man with an open mind. He was courteous and listened to many people, but he relied ultimately on his own financial intelligence to make his decisions. If you don't know anything, then any advice is better than no advice. But if you can't tell the difference between bad advice and good advice, then that is risky. Rich Dad firmly believed that most people struggle financially because they operate on financial information handed down from parent to child, and most people don't come from financially sound families. He often said, bad financial advice is risky, and most of the bad advice is handed out at home, not from what is said, but from what is done. Children learn by example more than words. Your advisors are only as smart as you. Rich Dad said, your advisors can only be as smart as you are. If you are not smart, they can't tell you that much. If you are financially well-educated, competent advisors can give you more sophisticated financial advice. If you are financially naive, they must by law offer you only safe and secure financial strategies. If you are an unsophisticated investor, they can only offer low-risk, low-yield investments. They often recommend diversification for unsophisticated investors. Few advisors choose to take the time to teach you because their time is money. So if you will take it upon yourself to become financially educated and manage your money well, then a competent advisor can inform you about investments and strategies that few will ever see. But first you must do your part to get educated. Always remember, your advisor can only be as smart as you. Is your banker lying to you? Rich Dad had several bankers he dealt with. They were an important part of his financial team. While he was close friends with and respected his bankers, he always felt he had to watch out for his own best interests, just as he expected the bankers to look out for their own best interests. After my 1974 investment experience, he asked me this, when a banker says that your house is an asset, is he telling you the truth? Since most people are not financially literate and don't know the game of money, they often must take the opinion and advice of people they tend to trust. If you're not financially literate, then you need to trust someone you hope is. Many people invest or manage their money based on someone else's recommendations more than their own. And that is risky. 
They're not lying. They're just not telling you the whole truth. The fact is that when a banker says your house is an asset, they're not really lying to you. They're just not telling you the whole truth. While your house is an asset, they simply don't say whose asset it is. If you read financial statements, it's easy to see that your house is not your asset. It is the bank's asset. Remember my rich dad's definitions of an asset and a liability from rich dad poor dad, an asset puts money in my pocket. A liability takes money out of my pocket. People on the left side don't really need to know the difference. Most of them are happy to feel secure in their jobs, have a nice house they think they own, are proud of, and think they're in control of. Nobody will take it away from them as long as they make those payments. But people on the right side need to know the difference. Being financially literate and financially intelligent means being able to understand the big picture of money. Financially astute people know that a mortgage doesn't show up as an asset, but as a liability on your balance sheet. Your mortgage actually shows up as an asset on a balance sheet across town. It shows up as an asset on the bank's balance sheet. Anyone, anyone who has taken accounting knows that a balance sheet must balance. But where does it balance? It doesn't really balance on your balance sheet. If you look at the bank's balance sheet, now it balances. Now it makes sense. That is B&I accounting. But this is not the way it's taught in basic accounting. In accounting, you'd show the value of your home as an asset and the mortgage as a liability. Also, an important point to note is that the value of your home is an opinion that fluctuates with the market, while your mortgage is a definite liability not affected by the market. For A, B and I, the value of your home is not considered an asset because it does not generate cash flow. What happens if you pay off your mortgage? Many people ask me, what happens if I pay off my mortgage? Is my house an asset then? And my reply is, in most cases, the answer is still no. It's still a liability. There are several reasons why this is true. One is maintenance and general upkeep. Property is like a car. Even if you own it free and clear, it still costs money to operate, and once things start to break, everything begins to break. In most cases, people pay for repairs on their house and their car with after-tax dollars. A person in the B and I quadrants only includes property as an asset if it generates income through positive cash flow. But the main reason a house, even without a mortgage, is still a liability is because you still don't own it. The government still taxes you even if you own it. Just stop paying your property taxes and you'll find out who really owns your property. That is where tax lien certificates come from, which I wrote about in Rich Dad Poor Dad. Tax lien certificates are an excellent way to receive up to 16% interest on your money. If homeowners don't pay their property taxes, the government charges them interest on the taxes owed at rates from 10% to 50%. Talk about being taken to the cleaners. If you don't pay the property taxes and someone like me pays them for you, then in many states, you owe me the taxes plus the interest. If you don't pay me within a certain amount of time, I get to take your house just for the money I put up. In most states, property taxes take priority in repayment, even before the bank's mortgage. I've had the opportunity to buy houses I paid the taxes on for just a few thousand dollars. The definition of real estate. Again, to be able to see money, you must see it with your mind, not your eyes. In order to train your mind, you must know the real definitions of words and the system of numbers. By now, you should know the difference between an asset and a liability and you should know the definition of the word mortgage, which is an agreement until death, and the word finance, which means penalty. You will now learn the origin of the words real estate and a popular financial vehicle called derivatives. Many people think derivatives are new, but in reality, their age is old. A simple definition of derivative is something that comes from something else. An example of a derivative is orange juice. Orange juice is a derivative of an orange. I used to think that real estate meant real or something that was tangible. My rich dad explain, explained to me that it really comes from the Spanish word real, which means royal. El Camino real means the royal road. Real estate means the royal estate. 
Once the agrarian age came to an end and the industrial age began around 1500, power was no longer based on the land and agriculture. The monarchs realized they had to change in response to the land reform acts that allowed peasants to own the land. So royalty created derivatives such as taxes on land ownership and mortgages as a way of allowing commoners to finance their land. Taxes and mortgages are derivatives because they are derived from the land. Your banker would not call the mortgage a derivative. They would say it is secured by the land, different words, similar meanings. So once royalty realized that money was no longer in the land, but in the derivatives that came from the land, the monarch set up banks to handle the increased business. Today, land is still called real estate because, no matter how much you pay for it, it never really belongs to you. It still belongs to the royals. What is your interest rate? Really? Rich dad, dad fought and negotiated tough for every single point of interest he paid. He asked me this question, when a banker tells you your interest rate is 8% per annum, is it really? I found out it's not if you learn to read numbers. Let's say you buy a $100,000 home, make a down payment of $20,000 and borrow the remaining $80,000 at 8% interest with a 30-year term from your bank. In five years you will pay a total of $35,220 to the bank, $31,276 for interest, and only $3,944 for debt reduction. If you take the loan to term, or 30 years, you will have paid $211,323 total principal and interest, less what you originally borrowed, $80,000. The total interest you will have paid, $131,323. By the way, that $211,323 doesn't include property taxes and insurance on the loan. Funny, $131,323 seems to be a little bit more than 8% of $80,000. It's more like 160% in interest over 30 years. As I said, they're not lying. They're just not telling the whole truth. And if you can't read numbers, you'd really never know. And if you're happy with your house, you'll never really care. But, of course, the industry knows that in a few years you're going to want a new house, a bigger house, a smaller house, a vacation house, or a refinance on your mortgage. They know it and, in fact, they count on it. Industry average. In the banking industry, a seven-year average is used as the life expectancy for a mortgage. That means banks expect the average person to buy a new house or refinance every seven years. And that means, in this example, they expect to get their original $80,000 back every seven years, plus $43,291 in interest. And that's why it is called a mortgage, which comes from the French word mortar or agreement until death. The reality is that most people will continue to work hard, get pay raises, and buy new houses with new mortgages. On top of that, the government gives a tax break to encourage taxpayers to buy more expensive houses, which means higher property taxes for the government. Every time I watch television, I see commercials where handsome athletes smile and tell you to take all your credit card debt and roll it in into a bill consolidation loan. That way, you can pay off those credit cards and carry a new loan at a lower interest rate. They tell you why it's financially intelligent to do this, a bill consolidation loan is a smart move on your part because the government gives you a tax deduction for the interest payments you make on your home mortgage. Viewers, thinking they see the light, run down to their finance company, refinance their home, pay off their credit cards, and feel intelligent. A few weeks later, they're shopping and see a new dress, a new lawn mower, or realize their kid needs a new bicycle or they need to take a vacation because they're exhausted. They have excellent credit, they pay their bills, their little heart goes pitter-patter, and they say to themselves, oh, go on. You deserve it. You can pay it off a little every month. Emotions overpower logic, and the credit card comes out of hiding. As I said, when bankers say your house is an asset, they are not lying. When the government gives you a tax break for being in debt, it is not because they're concerned about your financial future. The government is concerned about its financial future. So when your banker, your accountant, your attorney, and your teachers tell you that your house is an asset, they just fail to say whose asset it is. What about savings? Are they assets? Now, your savings really are assets. That's the good news.
But again, if you read financial statements, you'll understand the total picture. While it's true that your savings are assets, when you look across town at the bank's balance sheet, your savings show up as a liability. This is what your savings and checkbook balance look like in your asset column, and this is how your savings and your checkbook balance are carried on your bank's balance sheet. Why are your savings and checkbook balances a liability to banks? Because they have to pay you interest for your money, and it costs them money to safeguard it. If you can grasp the significance of these few drawings and words, you might begin to better understand what the eyes cannot see about the game of money. Why you don't get a tax break for saving money. If you notice, you get a tax break for buying a house and going into debt, but you don't get a tax break for saving money. Have you ever wondered why? I'm not sure either, but I imagine that one big reason is because your savings are a liability to banks. Why would they ask the government to pass a law that would encourage you to put even more money in their bank, money that is a liability to them? They don't need your savings. Besides, banks really don't need your savings. They don't need much in deposits because they can magnify money at least 10 times. If you put $1 in the bank, by law, the bank can lend out $10 and, depending upon the reserve limits imposed by the central bank, possibly much more. That means your single $1 suddenly becomes $10 or more. It's magic. When my rich dad showed me that, I fell in love with the idea. At that point, I knew that I wanted to own a bank and not go to school to become a banker. On top of that, the bank may pay less than 1% interest on that, that $1. In better economic times, it could be 5% and you, as a consumer, would feel secure because the bank is paying you something on your money. Banks see this as good customer relations because, if you have savings with them, you may come in and borrow money too. They want you to do this because they can then charge 9% or more on what you borrow. While you may make less than 1% on your $1, the bank can make 9% or more on the $10 of debt your single dollar has generated. Recently, I received a new credit card offer that advertised 8.9% interest. But since I understood the legal jargon in the fine print, I saw it was really 23%. Needless to say, I took a pass. They get your savings anyway. The other reason they don't offer a tax break for savings is more obvious. If you can read the numbers and see which way the cash is flowing, you'll notice that they'll get your savings anyway. The money you could be saving in your asset column is flowing instead out of your liability column in the form of interest payments on your mortgage. This ends up in the bank's asset column. The cash flow pattern looks like this, that's why they don't need the government to give you a tax incentive to save. They'll get your savings anyway in the form of interest payments on debt. Politicians aren't about to mess with the system because the banks, insurance companies, building industry, brokerage houses, and others contribute a lot of money to their campaigns, and the politicians know the name of the game. The name of the game. In 1974 my rich dad was upset because the game was played against me, and I didn't know it. I had bought this investment property and had taken a losing position, yet I'd been led to believe it was a winning position. I'm glad you entered the game, said rich dad. But because no one has ever told you what the game is, you've just been suckered over to the losing team. Rich Dad then explained the basics of the game. The name of the game of capitalism is, who is indebted to whom? Once I knew the game, I could be a better player instead of someone who just had the game run all over them. The more people you are indebted to, the poorer you are. The more people you're indebted to, the poorer you are, said Rich Dad. And the more people you have indebted to you, the wealthier you are. That's the game. As I said, I struggled to keep my mind open. So I stayed silent and let him explain. We're all in debt to someone else. The problems occur when the debt gets out of balance. Unfortunately, the poor people of this world have been run over so hard by the game that they often can't get any deeper into debt. The same is true for poor countries. The world simply takes from the poor, the weak, and the financially uninformed. If you have too much debt, the world takes everything you have, including your time, your work, your home, your life, your confidence, even your dignity, if you let them. I don't make the rules, but I do know the game, and I play it well. I'll explain the game to you if you want to learn to play. 
Then, after you've mastered the game, you can decide what to do with what you know. Money is debt. Rich Dad went on to explain that even our currency isn't an instrument of equity, but an instrument of debt. Every dollar used to be backed by gold or silver but is now an IOU guaranteed to be paid by the taxpayers of the issuing country. As long as the rest of the world has confidence in the American taxpayer to work and pay for this IOU called money, the world has confidence in our dollar. If that key element of money, confidence, suddenly disappears, the economy comes down like a house of cards. Take the example of the German Weimar government marks that became utterly worthless just before World War II. As one story goes, an elderly woman was pushing a wheelbarrow full of marks to buy a loaf of bread. When she turned her back, someone stole the wheelbarrow and left the pile of worthless money all over the street. That's why most money today is known as fiat money, money that cannot be converted to something tangible like gold or silver. The money, money is only good as long as people have confidence in the government backing it. Today, much of the global economy is based on debt and confidence. As long as we all keep holding hands and no one breaks ranks, everything will be fine. By the way, the word fine is my acronym for feeling insecure, neurotic and emotional. Who is indebted to whom? Going back to 1974 when I was learning how to buy that $56,000 condo, my rich dad taught me an important lesson on how to structure deals. Who is indebted to whom is the name of the game, said rich dad. And somebody just stuck you with the debt. It's like going to dinner with 10 friends. You go to the restroom and when you come back, the bill is there, but all 10 friends are gone. If you're going to play the game, then you had better understand it, know the rules, speak the same language, and know with whom you're playing. If you don't, instead of playing the game, the game will be played on you. It's only a game. At first I got angry at what Rich Dad was saying, but I listened and did my best to understand. Finally, he put it into a context that I could understand. You love playing football, don't you? He asked. I nodded my head. I love the game, I said. Well, money is my game, said Rich Dad. I love the money game. But for many people, money isn't a game, I said. That's correct, said Rich Dad. For most people, it's survival. For most people, money is a game they're forced to play, and they hate it. Unfortunately, the more civilized we get, the more money becomes a part of our lives. Rich Dad drew the cash flow quadrant. Just look at this as a tennis court, football field, or soccer field. If you're going to play the money game, which team do you want to be on, the E's, S's, B's, or I's? Or which side of the court do you want to be on, the right side or the left? I quickly pointed to the right side. If you take on debt and risk, you should be paid. Good, said Rich Dad. That's why you can't go out there to play the game and believe some sales agent when he tells you that to lose $150 a month for 30 years is a good deal because the government will give you a tax break for losing money and he expects the price of real estate to go up. You simply can't play the game with that mindset. While those opinions might come true, that's just not the way the game is played on the right side of the cash flow quadrant. Somebody is telling you to go into debt, take all the risks, and pay for it. People on the left side think that's a good idea, but not the people on the right. I was shaking a little. Look at it my way, said Rich Dad. You're willing to pay $56,000 for this condo in the sky. You're signing for the debt and taking all the risk. The tenant pays less in rent than what it costs to live there. So you're subsidizing that person's housing. Does that make sense to you? I shook my head. This is the way I play the game, said Rich Dad. From now on, if you take on debt and risk, then you should get paid. Got that? I nodded my head. Making money is common sense, said Rich Dad. It's not rocket science. But unfortunately, when it comes to money, common sense is uncommon. A banker tells you to take on debt so the government can give you a tax break. That doesn't make fundamental economic sense. Then a real estate agent tells you to sign the papers because he can find a tenant who will pay you less than you're paying but, in his opinion, the value of the condo will go up. 
If that makes sense to you, then you and I don't share the same common sense. I just stood there. I heard everything he said, and I had to admit that I'd gotten so excited by what I thought looked like a good deal that my logic went out the window and I didn't analyze the deal. Because the deal looked good, I had become emotional with greed and excitement, and I was no longer able to hear what the numbers and the words were telling me. It was then that rich dad gave me an important rule that he has always used, your profit is made when you buy, not when you sell. Rich dad had to be certain that whatever debt or risk he took on, it made sense from the day he bought it. It had to make sense if the economy got worse, and it had to make sense if the economy got better. He never bought on tax tricks or crystal ball forecasts of the future. A deal had to make sound economic sense in good times and in bad. I was beginning to understand the game of money as he saw it. Clearly, the game was to see others become indebted to you and to be careful to whom you became indebted. Today, I still hear his words, if you take on risk and debt, make sure you get paid for it. Rich dad had debt, but he was careful when he took it on. If you take on debt personally, make sure it's small. If you take on large debt, make sure someone else is paying for it. He saw the game of money and debt as a game that is played on you, played on me, played on everyone. It's played from business to business, and it's played from country to country. To him it was only a game. But for most people, money isn't a game. It's survival. And because no one explained the game to them, they still believe bankers who say a house is an asset. The importance of facts versus opinions. Rich Dad continued his lesson, if you want to be successful on the right side, you've got to know the difference between facts and opinions. You can't blindly accept financial advice the way people on the left side do. You must know the numbers. The numbers will tell you the facts. Your financial survival depends upon facts, not some friend or advisor's wordy opinions. I don't understand. What's the big deal about something being a fact or an opinion? Is one better than the other? No, replied Rich Dad. Just know when something is a fact and when something is an opinion. Still puzzled, I stood there with a confused look on my face. What is your family's home worth? Asked Rich Dad. Oh, I know, I replied quickly. My parents are thinking about selling so they had a real estate agent come in and do an appraisal. They said the house was worth $36,000. That means my dad's net worth increased by $16,000 because he only paid $20,000 for it five years ago. So, is the appraisal and your dad's net worth a fact or an opinion? Asked Rich Dad. I thought about it for a while and understood what he was getting at. Both are opinions, aren't they? Rich Dad nodded his head. Very good. Most people struggle financially because they spend their lives using opinions rather than facts when making financial decisions opinions such as, your house is an asset. The price of real estate always goes up. Blue chip stocks are your best investment. It takes money to make money. Stocks have always outperformed real estate. You should diversify your portfolio. You have to be dishonest to be rich. Investing is risky. Play it safe. I sat there deep in thought, realizing that most of what I heard about money at home was really people's opinions, not facts. Is gold an asset? Asked Rich Dad, snapping me out of my daydream. Yes. Of course, I replied. It's the only real money that has withstood the test of time. See, there you go again, smiled Rich Dad. All you're doing is repeating someone else's opinion about what is an asset rather than checking out the facts. Gold is only an asset, by my definition, if you buy it for less than you sell it for, Rich Dad said slowly. In other words, if you bought it for $100 and sold it for $200, then it was an asset. But if you bought one ounce for $200 and you sold it for $100, then gold in this transaction was a liability. It is the actual financial numbers of the transaction that ultimately tell you the facts. In reality, the only thing that is an asset or liability is you, because only you can make decisions that make gold an asset or a liability. That is why financial education is so important. 
I've seen so many people take a perfectly good business or piece of real estate and turn it into a financial nightmare. Many people do the same in their personal lives. They take hard-earned money and create a lifetime of financial liabilities. I was even more confused, a little hurt inside, and wanted to argue. Rich Dad was toying with my brain. Many a man has been suckered because he didn't know the facts. Every day I hear horror stories of someone who lost all their money because they thought an opinion was a fact. It's okay to use an opinion when making a financial decision, but you must know the difference. Millions of people have made li life decisions based upon opinions handed down from generation to generation. And then they wonder why they struggle financially. What kind of opinions? I asked. Rich Dad chuckled to himself before he answered, Well, let me give you a few common ones we have all heard. You should marry him. He'll make a good husband. Find a secure job and stay there all your life. Doctors make a lot of money. They have a big house. They must be rich. He has big muscles. He must be healthy. This is a nice car. It's only been driven by a little old lady. There is not enough money for everyone to be rich. The earth is flat. Humans will never fly. He's smarter than his sister. Bonds are safer than stocks. People who make mistakes are stupid. He will never sell for such a low price. She will never go out with me. Investing is risky. I'll never be rich. I didn't go to college so I'll never get ahead. You should diversify your investments. You should not diversify your investments. Rich Dad went on and on until finally he could tell I was tired of hearing his examples of opinions. Okay. I've heard enough. What's your point? Thought you'd never stop me, Rich Dad said, smiling. The point is that most people's lives are determined by their opinions rather than the facts. For a person's life to change, they first need to change their opinions and then start looking at the facts. If you can read financial statements, you'll be able to see the facts of an individual's or a company's financial success rather than going by opinions yours or somebody else's. As I said, one is not better than the other. But, to be successful in life, especially financially, you must know the difference. If you can't verify something is a fact, then it's an opinion. Financial blindness occurs when a person can't read a financial statement, leaving them to rely on someone else's opinion. Financial insanity is caused when opinions are used as facts. If you want to be on the right side of the cash flow quadrant, you must know the difference between facts and opinions. Few lessons are more important than this one. I sat there listening quietly, doing my best to understand what he was saying. It was obviously a simple concept yet it was larger than my brain could accept at that moment. Do you know what do due diligence is? Rich Dad asked. I shook my head. Due diligence simply means doing your homework and finding out which statements are opinions and which are facts. When it comes to money, most people are either lazy or searching for shortcuts, so they don't do enough due diligence. And there are still others who are so afraid of making mistakes that all they do is due diligence and then do nothing. Too much due diligence is also called analysis paralysis. The point is that you must know how to sift through facts and opinions, and then make your decision. As I said, most people are in financial trouble today simply because they've taken too many shortcuts and are making their life's financial decisions based upon opinions, often the opinions of an E or an S, and not the facts. If you want to be a B or an I, you must be keenly aware of this difference. I didn't fully appreciate Rich Dad's lesson that day, yet few lessons have served me better than that one. Years later, in the early 1990s, Rich Dad watched the stock market climb out of sight. His only comment was, that's what happens when highly paid employees or self-employed people with big paychecks, paying excessive amounts in taxes, greatly in debt, and with only paper assets in their portfolio begin handing out investment advice. Millions are about to get hurt following the opinions of people who think they know the facts. Warren Buffett, America's greatest investor, once said, if you're in a poker game and after 20 minutes you don't know who the patsy is, then you're the patsy. Why people struggle financially. 
Would you believe that most people will be in debt from the day they leave school until the day they die? It's true. This is the average middle-class American's financial picture. Someone else's balance sheet. If you now understand the game, then you may realize that those liabilities must show up on someone else's balance sheet as assets, like this, anytime you hear these words, low down payment. Easy monthly payments, or don't worry. The government will give you a tax break for those losses, then you know someone is luring you into the game. If you want to be financially free, you've got to be smarter than that. Most people don't have anyone who is indebted to them. They have no real assets, things that put money in their pocket, and they're often indebted to everyone else. That's why they cling to job security and struggle financially. If it weren't for their job, they'd be broke in a flash. In fact, the average American is less than three paychecks away from bankruptcy. They seek a better life and get run over by the game because the deck is stacked against them. They still think their house, car, golf clubs, clothes, vacation home, and other doodads are assets. They believe what someone else tells them because they can't read financial numbers to see the truth for themselves. Most people go to school and learn to be players in the game, but no one explains the rules to them. No one tells them that the name of the game is, who is indebted to whom. And because no one tells them that, they are the ones who become indebted to everyone else. Money is an idea. I hope you now understand the basics of the cash flow quadrant and know that money really is an idea that is more clearly seen with your mind than with your eyes. Learning the game of money and how it is played is an important part of your journey to financial freedom. Even more important is who you need to become to move to the right side of the cash flow quadrant. Part 2 of this book focuses on bringing out the best in you and on analyzing the formula. B. Do. Have. 